This fanless mini PC has four 10 gig ethernet ports, five two and a half gig ethernet ports. It has a port on the back that can turn it into a NAS. Inside, there is room for a ton of different SSD options. The processor is an eight core processor with built in Intel quick assist acceleration. And maybe the best part is that they start at under $300, making them well over a thousand dollars less than the equivalent PF sense units. We have so much to cover, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and this is the Quotum Q2033 2G9-S10. And while that might be a crazy name, some people are gonna think that this is by far the best home lab node that they've ever seen. The reason for that is that instead of using a consumer grade chip, whether it's an Intel Core, an AMD Ryzen, or some of the lower end Alder Lake N processors or something like that, this uses an Intel Denverton processor, which is the Intel Atom C3000 series. The eight core processor that's inside of this has things like built in SFP plus 10 gig networking. This was really designed for the 10 gig generation firewall appliance era. It also has plenty of connectivity for things like disks, NVMe SSDs. And in this particular unit, we also get five two and a half gig ethernet ports. And beyond that, this also includes Intel quick assist acceleration. If you're looking for something that's really a server and not a consumer platform that you're making into a server, then this is definitely something that you should be looking at. So you might be wondering why we have this QNAP four bay DAS over here. Well, the reason for that is that this has an external storage port and I'll show you how this connects in a little bit, but you can also turn this into a NAS while you're also running this as a router. And by the way, the cost of getting this setup is less than getting a true NAS mini X plus. So I think a lot of folks are gonna be excited by this one. And before we get too far in this, I just wanna say thank you to all the STH YouTube members who help support the STH YouTube channel by subscribing down below. If you could do that, that helps a ton when we go and buy all the stuff that you're gonna see that we're gonna put in the system. I, I think you guys are gonna be shocked. With that, like always, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so taking a look at the front of the system, you're gonna see some things that are normal and some things that are definitely gonna raise some eyebrows. The first thing you see is a little power button. And frankly, one thing I don't like about the system is that it is pretty hard to tell when it's on. Next, you get a VGA port and that's the display output. So I mentioned earlier that this is more of a server platform rather than a consumer desktop PC. And this is a really good example. You don't get HDMI ports, you don't get display port, anything like that. You have an old school VGA port because this is made to really be headless. The GPU, if you can call it that, that's powering this is an A-Speed AST2400. Now we ran Geekbench and Geekbench won't even go and show like, uh, you know, any any compute benchmarks or anything like that because it doesn't, doesn't have those kind of engines to be able to do that. So if you're looking at something that can also be partially a gaming PC or, you know, display things via HDMI outputs or something like that, this is the wrong option for you. Also, and very important here is that the Intel Atom series doesn't have an integrated GPU, so you don't get things like quick sync video or anything like that with this. This is really designed to be a server server platform, not a, you know, like transcoding platform. Okay, moving on, we get a SIM card slot, more on that in a little bit. Then we get a USB type C port and probably more exciting about this by far is this SFF8087 port. Now, if you know the difference between SFF8087 and SFF8088, this is the wrong port for an external connection. These 8087 ports are generally used for things like internal connectivity. However, it's on the outside of the chassis and the fact of the matter is that you can go and connect a short cable and use it for a DAS, which is what we're gonna show you in a little bit. You can find that section down below. Okay, flipping the system over, there are some uh, some more interesting things. So first off, you'll see that we do have Wi-Fi antenna lead spots, but we don't have a Wi-Fi card in here or wireless card in here. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get inside. Now, the next thing that you're gonna notice, which is kind of fun, is that over here, we have four SFP plus ports. Now, if you wanna look for, you know, if a NIC is supported or something like that, these generally are because this is an old enough platform where, you know, the NIC support is there, but it's the Intel X553 is the NIC that this uses. And so you can just plug your SFP plus adapters in here and you can get 10 gig ethernet and up to four ports. Now, next up, you're gonna see that we have five ethernet ports. These are Intel I225V ports and these are V3 ports. And so these aren't the I226, which is kind of a bummer, frankly, but on the other hand, you do get better support because they're I225. Still, the Intel I225V uses slightly more power than the I226V. And so this is just something that is kind of a bummer that we don't have the newest NICs. Okay, now next to this, we have USB ports. We have a USB 2 port, USB 3 port. You can see one is blue and one is black. And so to set this up, what we did was we, uh, you know, we used a little wireless keyboard and also a Ventoy disc. And so the original thought was we would put the little USB receiver for the Logitech wireless in the USB 2 port. And then we would put the USB 3 key with Ventoy 
in the top USB 3 port. And when we did that, the wireless keyboard and mouse just did not work. And so what we did is we flipped them using the wireless controller for the keyboard and mouse in the USB 3 port, and then the SanDisk in the USB 2 port, and everything worked fine, and we were able to go install OSs and all that kind of stuff. It's just one of those little tiny quirks that we found while going through the system. Okay, but let's keep going here. There is a console port. Now, this is a serial console. This is not an IPMI. So although this has an A-Speed AST 2400, this does not have IPMI out of band management. It's kind of a bummer. I wish it did. But on the other hand, that would probably raise the idle power consumption by another five or six watts or so, and also increase the price of the system by $25 to $30. Next to that, we have a 12 volt DC power input. That is something that we're going to talk a lot about in the power section. It's um, The power on this is a little bit different than you might think, but at least it's easy to go and get a 12 volt DC power input if you ever need one one day. Okay, now looking at the rest of the exterior of the system, you're going to see that this is a giant heatsink case, and uh, it is pretty darn, I mean, this thing is uh, definitely pretty heavy. What you will not see on this unit is you won't see a fan, and frankly, it gets pretty darn hot to the touch. It still works no problem, and the Intel Atom C3000 series was designed for extended temperatures because it is an embedded part, but on the other hand, we ran it for two weeks without issues, so I wouldn't say that it's something that necessarily freaks me out too, too much. And so looking at the bottom of the system real quick, uh, we get a like little made in China sticker, one of the first ones that we've seen on one of these systems. But then, uh, you know, you get little rubber feet that you can go put on, which is nice. There is a little Visa mounting, uh, you know, like pattern here, and they give you the standoffs to be able to do that. You don't get a nice bracket or anything like that, but I guess if you wanted to, sure, you could. But of course, you want to see what's inside the system, so let's get to that next. Okay, so opening up the system, you're gonna see uh, a couple things. So the first off is that you can see that we got a NVMe SSD with this. We got a configuration with 16 gigabytes of memory and 512 gigabyte NVMe SSD. It's a PCIe Gen 3 SSD. It's a Fizing controller SSD. And one of the stranger things about this is that the SSD is actually covered. And this is done in a lot of cases for things like, you know, if you have embedded products, it is actually a requirement that your uh, SSDs are actually covered like this. so that way people can't like go in, pull out, like cause these things get deployed at the edge, right? They can't like go in, pull off the NAND chips and then like reconstitute them later. So that's kind of a weird little embedded thing. And I wasn't really expecting to see that here. Also in the system, you're gonna see that we have two DDR4 SO DIMM slots. Now, a couple things. First off, this came with a single Kingston DIMM. Now the Atom C3000 series is a dual channel platform, number one. And the second thing to keep in mind is that it did support ECC memory. In fact, this processor not only supports ECC memory in SO DIMM, ECC SO DIMM format, but it also supports R so if you have like the big motherboards like from Supermicro or another vendor that we've reviewed on the STH main site, you'll see that those have slots and you can actually go put registered like RDIMMs in there and use ECC, like really good ECC memory in them. Since everything's a little bit weird with the move, we ended up only putting two 32 gig DIMMs in here and you can see that we get 64 gigabytes, no problem. That is a differentiator, however, against some things like the N100, N305, like all those kind of all the like N systems where you get a single channel of DDR5, you also tend not to be able to go put 64 gigs of memory in there. So if you do want more memory capacity, you can do that here. So let's talk a little bit about the expansion. First off, you know, we already talked about the NVMe SSD that's in here, but you can put a lot more. Underneath the two SSD slots, there is another slot, which I think is really for like a wire wireless card or something like that. So we, we don't have it configured. We didn't actually test it out, but that is something that if you do want to go explore, it's here. The next thing that you see is that above that, we have our two NVMe M.2 slots. Now, we thought that they might be by four slots, but they actually aren't. When we did the testing or performance testing of them, you can see in Crystal Discmark that these are actually only running at PCIe Gen 3 by two speeds, not PCIe by four speeds. Now, aside from that, we also got this little sat SATA cable and it provides both data and power connectivity to a SATA drive. So we put a two terabyte SATA drive in here and you can screw it onto the bottom of the chassis. Frankly, there's not a lot of airflow on the bottom of this chassis, so it does make me a little bit nervous, but we did run all this stuff, no problem in it, so I, I don't know what to tell you guys, it somehow worked. And let's talk about the processor in this one for a second. So this is the Intel Atom C3758, which is an eight core processor. There's another version of this, which has the Intel Atom C3758 R, and that R was a refresh upgrade. So we covered this on the STH main site. It was a refresh upgrade. And there are things like more high-speed IO lanes. So if you want that, I guess, you know, that's something that you could get. To be frank though, the performance difference between the two was less than 10% by far. So th they're pretty equivalent. I would just say that there's a big jump between getting the eight core variant, which is the 3758 versus the four core variant, which would be the 3558. And just talking about the processor for a second, this is still a 14 nanometer processor from Intel. So it is an older generation processor 
compared to what's out there today. And these processors are absolutely everywhere. You find them in things like, you know, 100 gigabit switches. You find them in firewalls. You know, we mentioned already the NetGate PFSense firewalls. Those are good examples of where you find them. You find them in things like the, you know, TrueNAS minis and mini XLs and all those kind of things. By far, one of the coolest things that this processor has in it though is Intel Quick Assist Acceleration. Now, the Quick Assist is a hardware accelerator for crypto and compression. And you can see we've done a bunch of stuff on this on the SDH main site. And one of the things that it allows you to do is do offloads for those crypto and compression tasks. So when you're doing those tasks, you don't need to be using your CPU cores. Instead, you can be using the accelerator. And that can be important if you're using things like PFSense Plus or you're using OPN Sense or something like that that support QAT by just checking a box out of the box. I mean, that is a huge benefit to these. You can do things like run IPsec VPNs at a much faster speed because you have a processor like this. Okay, now in terms of performance of this, there's a couple things I think folks definitely want to know. So of course you can go look up benchmarks. There's tons of benchmarks out there for the Intel Atom C3758 and 58R processors. You can find those all the heck over the place. STH has them, other places have them. So go look there. The other thing though, is that the OS support on these is awesome because they are kind of older and there's just tons of these processors out there. The driver support is very good. We've run pretty much everything on this. We've run Windows, Ubuntu, Proxmox. We've run OPN Sense, PF Sense, and TrueNAS, both TrueNAS and TrueNAS scale. And a nice feature is that because we are using the i225Vs and also we have the X553 10 gig NICs in here, you have everything that you need to be able to go and run this. And one of the nice things is because we are using the i225V, we have the X553 NICs and the older generation processor, that means that we are supported in just about everything. Now, of course, the performance of this Atom C3000 series processor is not gonna be the same as what you'll see from something like an Alder Lake N or the C5000, P5000 series of embedded processors. It's definitely an older generation. And in this line of embedded processors, the generational upgrades, is they're often not like 10, 15, 20%. Usually the upgrades in these come and they're like 70%. Percent upgrades gen on gen. So that's just something to keep in mind that getting a new generation Atom processor definitely gives you a lot more performance than what we're seeing here. On the other hand, there are some things that you get that are nice. You get eight cores, so you can go use like one or two for your hypervisor. You can go run one or two for something like a uh, like a firewall or something like that. And then you can run a NAS off of the others or storage off of the others. So there are definitely a lot of cores here and that gives you enough performance to do pretty much whatever you want. Now I know a lot of folks are gonna say like, hey, can this be running my one gig or two gig firewall? Firewall or something like that, and of course it can. If you go look at the NetGate 8200, that 8200 has the same-ish processor that's in here. And if you go through and you just kind of look at the numbers, you're gonna see that the routing performance is somewhere in the 11 to 18 gigabits per second. This is just slightly slower in terms of clock speed, but you're gonna get about the same speeds as, as NetGate got. In terms of the firewall performance, you're seeing anywhere from five to like 18 gigabits per second. So, you know, you could pretty much use this as like a 10 gig firewall, which is pretty awesome for like 300 bucks, right? And the other thing is if you do have access to the quick assist acceleration in whatever firewall platform you're using, you can often get IPsec VPN performance well into the, you know, over a gigabit per second range. So overall, the performance of this little box is absolutely phenomenal and it is way too much for a lot of folks, which means that you can also do things like virtualize and then run, you know, different applications all on this same platform. Okay, next, let's talk about the power consumption. Okay, so the power consumption of this was uh, not as good as I thought it was gonna be. So the overall power consumption, we've seen somewhere in the 16, 18 watts at idle. Depending on the configuration, you can easily push that into 20, you know, if you're putting a lot of like NVMe drives in there and dims and all that kind of stuff, you're gonna see about 20, 16 to 20 watts as your idle. And if you totally jam this thing like 100% that is using a stress test tool or something like that, you're gonna see that your power consumption is gonna go up into that maybe like 32 to 34 watt range. So it is a little bit more than a lot of folks are gonna be putting on something like a P like plus splitter or something like that. You're just not gonna be able to power that because it's gonna go a little bit too much. On the other hand, this is really the power behavior of the embedded parts because the embedded parts tend not to have like that crazy swing that you see between like, you know, TDP and what the actual power consumption is. Like you don't get those like, you know, 50, 60 watt from like idle to max. You're getting something that's more like 10, 12, 15 watts or something like that between your min and max, right? So this is a, a platform that can go up over 30 watts but frankly, most folks are not gonna run this at 100% on a stress test 24 seven. So you're probably gonna see something more in maybe the 16 to 25 watt range in your normal operations. Next, let's talk about this thing over here and our key lessons learned. Okay, so for our key lessons learned, I really wanna talk about something that we did 
using this SFF8087 port. So let me just kind of show you what we have here. This is a little uh, QNAP TLD400S, which is a four bay external SATA DAS enclosure, right? And so you have your four SATA bays up here and they are hot swappable. And then on the back here, there's really not that much going on, but there are a couple things like the big things, of course, that you want to know is that there is a fan to cool your drives. Then you have a power input, but the big feature is this one right here, which is an SFF8087 port. And normally how this kit is sold is that you get this little QNAP card with an Asmedia uh, four port SATA controller on it, which goes to your SFF8088, which is this cable right here. And that SFF8088 cable is what you would use to connect to both the card as well as the DAS. But of course, because we're a little bit in funky town here with these little systems, we don't have an SFF8088, which is an external SATA connection on the Quotum box. Instead, we have an SFF8087. So this is the SFF8087. SFF8087, and this is meant for internal connections, really. This is an SFF8088. You can see it's a more robust metal connector. It has a better latching mechanism and stuff like that. It really is made for external connectivity. And when we set this up, everything just showed up. It was super easy. There was no drama. No, we didn't have to go in the BIOS and set anything or anything like that. It just worked out of the box. The only thing that didn't work was one of the Western Digital 18 terabyte drives, which decided that today was the day that it would decide to stop working. We instead replaced it with a 20 20 terabyte drive, which somebody would completely give me a lot of junk if we showed a, you know, 18, 18, 18, 20 screenshot. So we're just going to show the 18s all here, but we replaced that drive and everything worked fine. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if you're thinking of a setup like this is that adding a DAS like this will add a ton of power. This total system, when we had it all connected, you can get over 60 watts of total power consumption because the DAS with four drive bays uses about as much power as the entire system here, the little Quotum system. But when we do the mini PC reviews and we talk about them in terms of servers or the tiny mini micro reviews, the one liter PCs and people, we talk, we talk about those in servers. People always ask for things like, oh, I wish I could put an external three and a half inch drive for more capacity, or I wish I had the ability to have multiple 10 gig network ports or some more two and a half gig network reports, or if I had just, you know, lower power or something like that. And guys, this checks all of those boxes. We took a screenshot in Windows where we had four 18 terabyte drives. We also had two NVMe SSDs, a SATA SSD, and 64 gigabytes of memory all in the same system. I mean, that is an absolutely monster, not just NAS, not just firewall, but it could easily run both. Now, a lot of folks give me a lot of junk because they always say like, you know, I wish your systems had more of something. And this has pretty much everything you need for a home lab setup. And the total cost of this entire setup, I think this was something like 300 bucks. Uh, we spent probably a couple bucks for the cable. And then we got this configured, you know, without the extra SSDs and all that kind of stuff for uh, just a little over $300. So you're talking about $700 all in, but you don't have to go and buy a firewall plus a NAS device. You have it all in one. And it may not be the most compact, but it's actually pretty easy to work on. And something else that I do want to point out is that if you do have a like work station or something like that, where, you know, you want to have a NAS and you want your drives to be connected to that NAS most of the time, but then maybe you want to go do a little import. You want to move data or something like that. Well, if that were the case, the extra parts in this, the little QNAP PCIe card, as well as the SFF8088 dual-sided cable, right? That would allow you to do that. You could literally just shut this thing off, pull the DAS enclosure off, and then go, you know, if you had your workstation, you could plug it directly in there. I mean, that is a pretty cool, that is a pretty cool capability guys. Hey guys, I hope you like this look at what might be the coolest little home lab system by a long shot. This has just about everything you need, especially if you want to have plenty of network connectivity and also storage connectivity. Well, this, this has everything you need all in one little bundle. And hey, if you did like this video or you know somebody that would like this video, well, why don't you share it with them, but also give the video a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.